My name is Christine Keneally. I'm founding director of Ireland's Great Hunger Institute at Quinnipiac University in the United States. The footsteps I'm walking in are those of Catherine Tai. Catherine, in 1847, was 10 years old. She emigrated with her mother, her father, and her four brothers. Unfortunately, only her brother Daniel and Catherine survived Brosiel. We know a bit about Catherine's story. Following them being orphaned, a Canadian couple wanted a strong young boy to work on the farm, and they wanted to adopt her brother Daniel. But when Catherine saw Daniel being taken away, she cried and she held on to his leg. And so the Canadian, French Canadian couple agreed to take both children. We know Catherine lived until her thirties and all that time she lived with her brother on the farm. But they were brought up as French Canadians and very much lost their own Irish culture. You know, this is saying the famine killed everything and in many ways it did. It didn't just kill people. It also killed a culture that was, before the famine, vibrant, distinctive, and had a very long history and tradition. There's another saying that because of the famine, music, poetry, and dancing died, and those things never returned. But if you can imagine, for people who survived the famine, who remained in Ireland, they had suffered for seven years of malnutrition, of trauma, and of seeing their communities, their families, torn apart. So how were they to operate in this new world? And in the new world where the famine in many ways wasn't over, even after 1852, there was massive emigration from Ireland. So in a real sense, there was a depopulation. We know the population of Ireland was eight and a half million, at least in 1841. By 1851, it was six and a half million. But by 1901, it had dropped to four million people. So the countryside was very empty, very depopulated. And again, those people who left Ireland tended to be the healthiest, the youngest, the most ambitious. So that left behind an older generation who had witnessed the famine and who didn't want to celebrate or commemorate. We know again from folklore that people stopped dancing at crossroads. They stopped being joyous. It took many, many years for them to recover that. The other thing we know is something that's hard to measure. People talk about the silences that accompanied the famine and that were absent but present in the countryside after the famine. During the famine, people talk about the birds disappearing, the frogs disappearing. The landscape was silent. And again, that seems to have carried over into the post-famine society. But the other thing which shaped that society was 1852 didn't mark an end to famines in Ireland. There was a famine 1861 to 1862, 1879 to 1880, in 1890, in 1895. So famines, even if they were localised, continued to be a way of life in Ireland. So again, people always lived in fear of real hunger and of the need to emigrate. And if we look at the end of the 19th century, when parallel with Ireland trying to win in political independence, there was also a revival, a cultural revival. In many ways, the famine was missing from that cultural revival. And again, it makes sense because how, you, how can you commemorate a tragedy that is so awful and so near to people? So if we look at the cultural revival, we have to search very hard to find any references to the suffering of our people during those years. There are many lessons to be learned from the famine because essentially the Irish famine, famines today, are really questions of social justice. Many famines are artificial, man-made famines. They don't need to occur. The Irish famine, as we know, massive amounts of food continue to be exported while people starved in Ireland. At that stage, Ireland was not only part of the United Kingdom, it was part of the British Empire, the most successful and prosperous empire ever in the world. 
and that empire had many resources, but it chose not to deploy those resources to save lives. And for me, it comes from humanitarian, a, a lack of humanity, a position that says people are poor because they're lazy. And that really framed the way in which relief was given during the Great Famine. And in many ways, it still frames the way we regard poverty, the poor, hunger and famine in the world today. We see it as the fault of the individual, not the fault of structures. And I think if we learn anything from our Great Famine, it's that it did not need to happen.